that we have quite a number of similarities between now uh, the ongoing economic challenges confronting generally the world and especially in Africa. So the ongoing economic crisis facing the world today and Africa especially has a lot in common to the market, you know, uh, to the economic crisis and market reform of the 19. Uh, uh, ages and and so there are a number of things you see a uh, lot of similarities and I am sure that um, you will enjoy today's uh, lecture. Secondly, today's lecture builds up on our lecture last week, uh, which is um, so the state building, you know, a, 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 a project. So in today's uh, uh, lecture, the objectives of today's lecture are basically to give a brief background of the African economic crisis, examine the nature and character of the African uh, crisis, then we we'll proceed to explain the competing argument for the crisis, and then we analyze the prescriptions and solutions to the crisis. And finally, we assess the impact of the structural adjustment program uh, on African economies and livelihoods. So this is the background um, uh, from hope to despair. So as I mentioned last week, uh, many African countries obtained independence in the 1960s. Uh, uh, and there was high expectations among the African people that for the first time, Africans themselves will be governed by people that are African and who have been elected by African people because the European powers um, um, you know had left the continent and the expectation was that since Africans have taken over the reins of governance there will be freedom there will be prosperity there will be economic development and there will there will also be unity which is precisely what our nationalist leaders when I say nationalist leaders Last week, I mentioned their names. Those African leaders who led us into independence, the Kwame Nkrumah, the Securities, you know, um, the Kenneth Kawunde, the Julius Nyerere, and so on and so forth. They were the founding uh, 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 fathers of Africa. We had a lot of confidence in them that they would do well and that they would deliver freedom, prosperity, economic development. But unfortunately, this high expectation and excitement turned into despair in the 1970s and 1980s. Remember, one of the profound declarations made by Ghana's first president, Osadipo Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, was that African people should seek ye first the political kingdom and all else shall come, unquote. In other words, what was most important at that time was to gain independence, get the Europeans out of the continent, Africans govern themselves, and once that happens, which is the political kingdom, which is independent, then everything will turn out very well. But as I, say, as I said earlier, the, the, the hopes of a glorious future, you know, very exciting future for Africa, turned into despair in the 1970s and 80s. Why? What happened? Because Africa was hit by a very severe economic crisis, and that crisis devastated African economies and African livelihoods. As a result, in African politics, the 1980s is referred to as the last decade of African development. There was virtually difficult moments in the 1980s. Economic growth stagnated, poverty increased, cost of living rose, and there were a lot of you know uh, uh, economic uh, you know challenges during that. So if there was a lot of economic challenges during that period, then what was the nature 
time crisis. So the nature and characteristics of the African crisis. So the main features of the African crisis of the 1980s was one of the balance of payment difficulties. Um, so you don't need to be an economist to appreciate uh, the, 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 the term, you know, uh, balance of payment. So it's a situation whereby a country spends more than it gains by way of revenue. So every country, you know, as you are already aware, uh, they will read, you know, the Minister of Finance or appropriate government uh, 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 authority who read the budget for a particular year in which the budget provides details of what government intends to spend, how much it intends to spend, the kind of items that it wants to spend on, and then also how it uh, intends to mobilize revenue uh, for that particular year. So uh, every year you have, you know, government earning some revenues largely from exports and from other sources. Uh, but at the same time also uh, incurring, you know, or paying for some expenditures. When what you uh, spend on, that is your spending, exceeds your revenue target, then it means that you are faced with a balance of payment difficulties. Then becomes very difficult and very challenging for government to meet some uh, pressing uh, national expenditures. Uh, 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 and so on and so forth. The second feature of the economic crisis of the 1980s was is what we refer to as unsustainable debt burden. So when we say that a country is debt burden or is faced with debt crisis, it means that you are you have incurred so much debt will be by way of loans, whether bilateral, multilateral, or from other sources. To extend that you are unable to pay or service uh, those debts. So it becomes unsustainable when you are unable to service the debt. So when you countries, you know, uh, generally will go for some loans, uh, we call it the principal, the full amount that you go for. But it requires that service the debt you know, every you know it could be every month or quarterly or whatever you have to service um, the uh, 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 interest on the debt until um, the full uh, duration of payment of the whole loan is due but now you are faced with uh, uh, you know a situation where you owe so much but worse yet you are unable to even service the interest on the debt, then it becomes unsustainable. And you can relate this practically to what is happening in the global economy, especially in African countries today. Most African countries, including Ghana, are highly indebted and they are unable to service their debt. That is why there is a lot of debt restructuring is going on, especially for countries that have gone for bailout or sought assistance from the IMF. We provide some conditionalities, and these conditionalities include uh, 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 the countries should restructure their debt uh, with their creditors, uh, uh, achieve or arrive at some consensus and some agreement before uh, the bank, World Bank, or IMF will go ahead to release uh, 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 loans and, and, and grants and so on and so forth. Then another issue, another important feature is high inflation and high interest rate. This one also, I'm sure it resonates uh, powerfully with ongoing economic challenges in the world, uh, including Africa and of course in Ghana. So you, um, because of exchange rates, uh, um, the depreciation of the currency, so if it is Ghana, then it is the CD versus uh, the dollar, if it is Nigeria, it is the Naira versus, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the dollar or other foreign 
depreciation of their currency and also because of their huge debt and balance of payment difficulties. It all comes to a situation where you have a lot of money in the system, you know, uh, chasing a uh, 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 fewer uh, goods and, and, and products. So when that happens, there is high inflation uh, 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 in, in the system and inflation they say is bad for the economy, is bad for the poor people, is bad for trading, is bad for economic uh, uh, development. And that also affects the interest rate because if you want to go and you know borrow or take loan from the bank, they will set the interest rate so high that um, there is a huge disincentive to actually go for loan because the interest that you pay on the loan is so high and sometimes unreasonable. And it is also because the banks want to make sure that you know they take the necessary steps in view of the inflation and other depreciation of the currency and so on and so forth, so that uh, they don't entirely you know um, um, run into uh, a crisis uh, themselves. So high interest rate makes it difficult for the private sector for individuals who want to take loan or uh, borrow some money from the bank to do so. And around this time, with economic challenges, the banks are also very, very, very cautious in giving out uh, loans for fear of a uh, high rate of default. Another feature of the economic crisis is high unemployment. Yes, you can also relate that to the ongoing economic crisis and the challenges that many African countries are going through and Ghana are uh, not exception. That's uh, it's very difficult to find jobs and especially for young people, especially for those who have completed university, most of them have difficulty um, uh, finding uh, jobs to do. And so uh, really it becomes very, very, very uh, difficult uh, for people to find jobs and also to you know, uh, live a meaningful uh, life. And so around this time, we hear uh, people forming associations like unemployed graduate association and so on and, and, and so forth. Because the economy is in crisis, the economy is in a very difficult situation. Um, there are no opportunities for hiring, job placement, and so on and so forth. And then finally, decline in the price of primary uh, 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 commodities. So around this time also, one of the key features of the African economic crisis is the you know lower prices of primary commodities. Now, in the 1960s, when majority of the African countries got independence, thankfully, the prices of primary commodities like you know uh, cocoa, you know. Um, um, uh, cocoa and other minerals like gold, diamond, you know, uh, and so on and so forth, you know, bauxite, you know, uh, uh, the prices uh, were very good, you know, and remember the prices are never set in Africa, uh, the prices are set, you know, on the world market, so the world market prices for gold, cocoa, uh, diamond, and so on and so forth was very good, and for countries uh, in Africa that specialize in the production and export of raw materials to Europe. They got some good money for the gold, for the diamond, and so on and so forth that they exported. So they got some uh, good revenues. But because of the economic crisis,
what actually caused the African smell. economic crisis. Um, so different um, explanations have been offered by scholars, but overall, we can put those explanations into two main uh, 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 forms. So two major explanations have emerged to explain the economic crisis. The first explanation is what we call the neoliberal school of thought, uh, which tend to internalize the problem uh, by blaming African government. So when we say the neoliberal uh, school of thought, that is the kind of explanation championed or provided by the World Bank, the IMF, and other neoliberal scholars and institutions. For them, they blame the whole economic crisis on African leaders. They argue that the problem is more internal, the problem is more the fault of the African people and not external forces. I will, I will elaborate more on this point as I proceed short. Now the second explanation or the second view of thought are those who disagree with the neoliberal uh, school. Um, is that they tend to externalize the problem by blaming external forces, especially the nature of the international political economy. So there are two, in, 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 in short, there are two main schools. One, we call them the neoliberal school of thought. They are usually people who advocate for neoliberalism. And it's the IMF and the World Bank. They are the lead institutions that push this kind of argument. And the argument is simple. If you want to understand the economic crisis that confronted Africa in the 1980s, then you don't have to look far. Look within the small internal problem. It's the African people. They cause it. So that is the argument. Now, the second school of thought, they disagree with this IMF and World Bank. But instead, they argue that the problem is not with Africa. It's not internal. If you want to understand it, look external. Look at the policies and the programs of the IMF and the World Bank. Look at the policies and programs of the developed economies towards Africa. And that is where you will find the answer. So the second school of thought is usually African scholars, you know, call them the Africanist school of thought, or African leaders themselves. That is the kind of position that they have taken. So in short, you see it is like a, a blame game. Right? The IMF and World Bank are accusing Africans for running the economy down. And then the African leaders are also blaming the IMF and the World Bank for, you know, being uh, part of the problem. So in the next uh, slide, we will now look at the two schools of thought and discuss them further. So what are the main arguments of the neoliberal school of thought or the internalist school of thought? So the neoliberal school of thought, they provide a number of reasons why they believe that the problem was caused by Africans themselves. One of them is primary cause of the African crisis, they argue lies with the African government. Why are they blaming African government? Because they argue that African leaders have the propensity to introduce 
Mountain Africa. And when this uh, 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 committee led by Elliot Beck, when they finally completed their report and submitted it to the World Bank, they identified bad policies um, being implemented by African leaders. So the Berg report was conclusive that the problem and the challenges confronting African economic development was precisely because of a number of bad policies implemented by African leaders. One of the bad policies is excessive state intervention in the economy. You know, after the Second World War, a certain economic model emerged globally, which we call, we call it a welfare state. And that welfare state was led by the states. So last week we talked about some of these issues. Because after the Second World War, many of the newly independent countries, including those in Africa, didn't have African entrepreneurs with the capital to invest in the economy. And so the state now had to lead development of those newly independent countries in Africa and Europe, uh, Latin America, and then of course Asia. So right from the beginning of independence, the state, the government became deeply involved in the running of the economy. So last week we saw it, status policies, centralization policies, and so on and so forth. So, because government was really running the economy, there was very little space for the market, you know, demand and supply, or the private uh, sector to be involved in the economic development. So, each time the government will have to go and find money and use it to construct roads, the bridges. Last week we talked about this, create jobs, state-owned enterprises, uh, fund education fund healthcare and so on and so forth. Everything revolved around the states and the government and not the private sector nor the market. Then again there was overvalued national currency. And this is really interesting. Overvalued national currency um, currently also we are facing the same difficulties in many of the African countries. If you look at the depreciation of the uh, local currencies, whether it is Naira, CD, or whatever, versus the, the the dollar or the euro or the British pound, you will see that as a result of the depreciation, you need more local currencies, you know, to be able to get uh, a new uh, foreign currency. And so, what this government had done is that instead of allowing the market forces to determine the exchange rate, they would intervene and fix the exchange rate. Say if today one dollar is fifteen, uh, uh, one US dollar is uh, fifteen, uh, you know, uh, to the local currency. Um, that would mean you need more local currencies to be able to get dollar. But this car, this government will intervene and fix a certain rate that will be very close to the US. You know, or the foreign currency exchange regime, regime. But that is not how it is done. The foreign exchange, you know, market is governed by market forces and not what you, the leader, thinks that because the, uh, the, the, the dollar or the foreign currency is too strong and is probably making uh, meaningless of your currency, you will also intervene and peg it as a, a certain, you know, artificial rate. But unfortunately, that is what many of the African leaders did, and that really affected the economy more. When you do that, when you decide to intervene and determine and decide how much your currency should go vis-a-vis uh, -vis the dollar, that is a very bad way of intervening in the economy. And then finally, another bad 
relative to the agricultural sector, it will able to increase output and you'll be able to, you know, export more and you'll be able to get a lot of foreign currency to run your economy. But unfortunately, many of the governments didn't invest in agriculture. Rather, they focused so much on industries. We talked about the state owned you know, industries and so on and so forth. Yes, it is good to be interested in, you know, creating and investing in state owned enterprises, right? And industries. Industrialization is, is good. But remember, and last week we talked about it, even when you have established the industries, you will need the raw material from agriculture. But this is the case that agriculture, you know, uh, there were no incentive, government was not, you know, uh, investing in agriculture, neglected agriculture. Agriculture, which employed majority of the people, wasn't doing very well. So, from the neoliberal school of thought, from the IMF, from the World Bank, these were the bad policies that African leaders implemented that caused the economic crisis. Now, in what follows, I will proceed to discuss the solution. So, the World Bank position, World Bank IMF, the neoliberal school, their position is simple. The African economic crisis was caused by African leaders because of their desire and propensity to implement bad policies. And so the only way out for African people is to begin to abandon and do away with the bad policies and think about implementing good policies. The question then is, what are the good policies? From the perspective of the neoliberal school, from the perspective of the internally school, from the perspective of the IMF World Bank, good policies are enshrined in structural adjustment program. And when we say structural adjustment program, it's simply a neoliberal economic reform strategy that is promoted by the IMF and the World Bank in the 1980s uh, 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 and so on and so forth. And please take note that it started in the 1980s, but we still implementing different forms and phases of structure adjustment. Structure adjustment is ongoing under different names. Please take note. So structure adjustment, another name for structure adjustment is what we call Washington Consensus. So please, anytime you hear of Washington Consensus, it is the same thing as structure adjustment. Washington Consensus is a term coined by some Latin American scholars to refer to structure adjustment in Latin America. But basically, it is the same thing. And I will elaborate on this. So the 1991 Berg Report laid the framework for structure adjustment. So the Berg Report that I talked about blamed African leaders for the crisis and said that the only way for African leaders to overcome economic crisis is to implement structure adjustment. And structure adjustment are a set of policies that are considered necessary for countries who are faced with economic crisis. So anytime you have economic crisis, the World Bank IMF will tell you to implement some kind of structure adjustment. So what is all this thing about structure adjustment? What is it? So, structure adjustment simply means that, you know, you are in a very, very difficult economic situation. Your economy is very, very bad. And you need some loans to be able to turn the economy around. IMF World Bank is saying that, oh, if you want loans, we have money for you. But on condition that you agree to make changes or agree to implement some economic, you know, policies. In other words, you have to switch from the kind of bad policies that you have been implemented, you have, you have been implementing or implemented, to a new policy regime that they consider as low, as, as good. So we have the money for you as low. But we won't give it to you. We will only give it to you if you agree to implement 
that the IMF and the World Bank expect countries facing economic crisis to implement? What are the specific policies and programs? So in this slide, that is what we're going to discuss. So IMF is saying that, well, if you want us to help you, IMF World Bank will tell you, if you want money from them, you want them to support you, then you should agree to do the following. Reduce the role of the state in the economy and open up the market to operate. As I as I mentioned earlier, you know, during the post independent era, the, the government or the state was deeply involved in every aspect of the economy. Right. And that created a lot of the difficulties that we have. So IMF is saying reduce the role of the state. Open up the market. Right, allow market forces of demand and supply and the private sector to lead economic development. The state has no business in running the economy. The state has to create the necessary environment and allow the private sector and the market forces to operate. So from the neoliberal perspective, everything revolves around the private sector. It revolves around the market. And there is very little space for the state or the government. And, and that limited space is that just create the environment and allow the private sector to lead development. The state cannot lead development. So that is one. Two, fiscal discipline or cut down government spending. Remember, as we discussed last week, because of poverty and because of lack of development at independence, the founding leaders, you know, the Kwame Nkrumah, the Nariri, the Kenneth Kaunda, you know, the Sekuturis, the, you know, Sangos, you know, decided to, you know, uh, spend more on health, free education, free health care, free Medicare, you know, uh, building industries, you know, and, and so on and, and, and so forth as part of the nation building project. But they were spending a lot of money without getting enough revenue. And so the World Bank is saying that there was lack of fiscal discipline. You don't spend what you don't have. And presently, as I said, we, we have a lot in common with the ongoing economic difficulties in the world, in Africa, in Ghana, in Af you know, versus the rest of the world. The same prescription is what the IMF is telling countries like Ghana that have gone uh, for bailout or uh, seeking financial assistance from them. They are telling them to cut down spending, right? And, 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 and so on and so forth. Then they also, uh, another policy is remove subsidies on agriculture, health and education. So last week we discussed and we learned that because of the nation building a uh, project government give a lot of subsidies to agriculture to help and education free education free medicare and so on and so forth but the world bank is now saying that please remove or cut down on those subsidies that you give to agri sector you give to health and education and that is what led to the introduction of USA fees. So now in the universities, in the education sector, at the tertiary level, there is now something we call cost sharing or introduction of USA fees in health. When you uh, visit the hospital, you have to pay something. You know, in the past it was free um, and so on and, 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 and so forth. So in other words, government cannot be spending and taking care of their citizens. Their citizens must also be responsible and pay something towards their education, towards their health care, towards their medicare, and towards agriculture. And then also privatization. Remember, as part of the nation building project, one of the key policy uh, models was industrialization. You know, establishment, creation of state-owned, you know, industries across Africa. 
businesses, uh, they were operating under thirty percent. You know, so you build this huge thing, but you were operating under less than thirty percent. In other instances, also, we saw that they didn't even have, you know, the equipment. You know, all the equipment had to be imported at a very high, you know, prices. And then, of course, the expertise who were or are those who are going to run those machinery. You know, at the time that we are just emerged out of independence, uh, the colonial masters, you know, the Europeans did not promote education, especially higher level education, technical skills, and so on and so forth, more, you know, uh, was lacking. So you needed to hire the services of, you know, foreign expatriates, and you have to pay them in foreign currency. So really, most of the state owned industries were running at huge losses. So the IMF, uh, I, uh, IMF and the World Bank told African leaders to privatize those state owned enterprises, you know, sell them off into the private hands and so on and so forth. Remember, most of those industries were owned by the state and fully funded by the state, but they were very poor, they were not doing that work. Other policies include liberalization of interest rates, the state should stop uh, artificially fixing interest rates below market value. So as I explained to you, um, you know, in, in a liberalized or liberalized regime, interest rates are fixed per demand and supply, and not a particular government saying that, I don't like the way the dollar is too strong, creeping our local currency. So me to I'll do something to make it artificial and get it, you know, force your local currency to be stronger. That was what some of the African leaders did, and it was very, very detrimental to their whole economic development. So IMF and World Bank is saying, please, African leaders, stop overvaluing your currency. Allow, you know, the interest rate to be uh, governed in a liberalized regime through the market uh, uh, and demand and supply. And then trade liberalization. Trade liberalization simply means that the state should remove trade barriers and restrictions on trade, both imports and exports. So here, this is also another very, very difficult you know, policy regime. So what had happened is that because many of the African leaders had established industries which were very young. In Europe, they started with their industrialization somewhere around the 18th and 19th century. Their industries had been in place for several, several, several decades, and they were very strong. Now you have just established young industries. The question is, can your young industries compete with those in Europe? It's not possible. So what some of the uh, African leaders did, which is precisely what the industries in Europe and, and, and North America did at the initial stages when they were very young, they gave them some protection. In North America, including the United States, they, they gave protection to their very young industries to grow. Europe also did the same. So in Africa, African leaders also did the same. But the you know, World Bank IMF saying that no, you can't do that. Remove all protection. Allow, you know, imports and exports to come in and go out as and when it is necessary. What this means is that if you open up your economy, then many of the African countries became dumping sites. So Europeans will be dumping their produce including used clothing, used uh, fridges, everything used, anything dirty, anything that they don't need in their country, they will ship them and dump them in your country for you to buy and probably sell them. But at the same time, your product, you cannot get your product, whether it is cocoa, whether it is banana, 
don't have the opportunity to do so. So you see the difficulty that many Africans, African countries have themselves. Now, most African countries have become dumping sites of waste and unnecessary European things that they have no value and of no use to. They dump them for African people to buy and use them. And then finally, deregulation. Deregulation means that you reduce barriers to private business operation. So um, you have to be able to liberalize your economy, deregulate the system in such a way that you remove, you know, all kinds of, you know, incentives and subsidies, you know, and so on and so forth. And I'm sure that most of you will identify with deregulation, especially at the, at the pump, you know, uh, if you uh, want to buy fuel. Now that is what they are saying. Government in the past uh, provided state subsidies. You know, government used to subsidize fuel. So that if you and I go to the pump to buy fuel, um, we don't buy at the market, but because government is paying at least some percentage for us. But they are saying that government should do away with all those, you know, uh, subsidies and things that it's used to uh, give to citizens to enjoy. And that citizens must pay full value at the pump for fuel, you know, and, and, and oil, and then, and then for gas, and so on, and so forth. So these are the specific policies of new liberal structure adjustment policies. And I'm sure that most of you can identify these policies with ongoing bailouts and debt restructuring and all the lights that African countries are currently being advised uh, to implement uh, in the post-COVID and post-Russia, you know, Ukraine economic, you know, uh, 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 crisis. So basically, such adjustment also revolves around what you call export led growth. So what it, it means, export led growth simply means that you see, you African people, whether it is Ghana, Nigeria, you, are you have a certain speciality. You are good at producing cocoa. So you produce the cocoa and then in the raw stage, export them to Europe because that's where they have the industries and the factories, right? Or now export, export them to China, export them to Turkey, export them to the US and so on and so forth. Even your gold and your, your crude oil, right, when you have them, because that is your strength, don't bother yourself to turn them into finished products, but rather export them in the raw state to Europe, where they will buy them cheaply, and then add value to it through their industries, and then you will import them at a very high cost into your country. So basically, that is what we have been uh, implementing for a very long time. And the export-led growth policy is not new. During the colonial era, that is what the Europeans, you know, uh, taught the African people to do. They told them to forget about, you know, uh, creating industries and adding value, and that they have competitive advantage in exporting their produce to Europe at a raw state for Europe to add value to it so that you, the African people, will now import them at high prices. So let me give you an example. You have your cocoa. How many industries do we have in Africa or African countries that produce cocoa? 
African leaders or virtually all the crises in Africa. But in so doing, they ignored the historical factors, including slavery and colonial legacy. Remember, I told you in our first, you know, pre-orientation meeting that Africa as a continent spent nearly 400 years under slave trade and spent another 60 to 70 years under colonial rule. So this is a continent that has spent a total of 470 years under foreign domination or anti-imperialist European rule. Now all of a sudden you have gained independence and you are very young and you are being blamed for all the things that had happened to your economy and that the Europeans in which you spent your 470 years do not want to take any responsibility for the number of years that you spent on their control and dominance where they were not willing develop the continent, they were not willing to establish schools. I told you the few schools that we had on the continent was established by the missionaries, you know, uh, you know, and the churches and so on and so forth. So you cannot, you couldn't have, it is not fair to blame African leaders for the economic crisis that hit the continent in the 1980s without taking into consideration all the 470 years that we spent under slavery and under colonial regime. Secondly, in blaming the African leaders, they also ignored the role of external or international, you know, shocks, such as the oil price hikes in the 1970s by OPEC, that is oil producing countries. Now let me take time to explain this. In the 1970s, we had two major oil price hikes. One was 1973-74, and then another one was 1978-79. What happened is that, you know, around that time, all the countries that produced, you know, uh, crude oil came together to form an association called Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, in short, OPEC. Now, these countries that were well known for producing crude oil, the majority of them were in the Arab countries, right? And at that time, only few African countries were producing crude oil. Very few of them, Nigeria and their lives. But at that time, Ghana had not discovered oil. So all of us were buying crude oil from the international market and the price used to be fairly low and reasonable. Then from nowhere, the OPEC country, that the countries producing oil, a lot of them from the Arab countries, decided to increase the prices of crude oil all of a sudden. Indeed, they quadrupled the prices of crude oil. So think about it. Crude oil uh, was costing around two point two point ninety dollars a barrel. Then all of a sudden, they increased it to about eleven dollars sixty five, eleven dollars and sixty five cents. You know, per crude. this is a sudden thing, and it was coming at a time that many African countries had 
producing. So there was shortage of crude oil at the world market. And there is demand and supply issue. So if there is shortage in crude oil, then the prices will go up. Anytime there is more crude oil produced on the world market, then the prices will fall. So basically, that was what happened. They were not doing it to punish the Africans, but rather they were doing it to punish the United States for supporting Arab Israeli conflict. Then the other challenge is global financial crisis and recession. So please note that the economic crisis that occurred in Africa in the 1980s was not unique to Africa. It was a global recession. It affected the whole world. United States was affected. North American countries affected. European countries affected. Latin America affected. But of course, it was more severe than the case of Africa. Because what happened was that because the Europeans and the Americans were affected, they also needed to respond. And the way they respond was that they decided to cut down on their import from African countries. And also, they were not also willing to import more from Africa. So, in the first place, you were not getting good prices for your raw materials. And secondly, they were not even importing enough. Then also, in the 1980s, unfortunately, there was something that Year drought and famine occurred in Africa, especially in the Sahel region. You know, so talking about you know uh, Niger, you know Chad, Mali, you know, and so on, and and Burkina Faso. You know, there 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 was severe drought. There was not enough rainfall, and there was famine. That there was huge hunger. You know. And people were not getting, the rains were not coming, farmers were not able to get enough rainfall for their farm. Um, there was issue of food security, people couldn't get food to buy, to eat, and so on and so forth. So this drought and famine uh, occurred mostly in the Sahel part of Africa. And so these were some of the things that caused the African economic crisis. But in thinking about it, you realize that for the new liberal school, the IMF World Bank, they ignore all these important factors that also affected the African economy. But rather, they blame African leaders for the bad policies. These were some of them are natural occurrences which the African leaders didn't have any hand. For example, when it comes to drought, when it comes to lack of rainfall when it comes to farming and those kind of things um african leaders didn't have much control you know over some of these uh, 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 issues especially uh, uh, when it happens at the sahara region so i will pause here and then you have the floor to ask questions so if you have any question at all about what we have discussed uh, thus far uh, let me know you can you can unmute and ask your question. Um, with the new liberal school of thought, where they blame African leaders for the economic crisis and they feel that the solution is implementing good policies and they believe that good policies are in the structure adjustment specific policies and programs. Now let's look at the externalist school of thought. And as I mentioned to you, the Estanile School of Thought uh, also a, a, a position championed by African leaders and African policymakers who in turn, you know, blame the crisis on external shocks. So in a document published in 1980, the Lagos Plan of Action, African leaders and policymakers trace the crisis to external shocks such as one, declining terms of trade high interest rate and growing debt service commitment. So the African leaders are saying that, look, you cannot entirely blame us for this crisis. So in 1980, they published a document 
which was to counter the Berg report. And the document published by African leaders and African policymakers is called the Lagos Plan of Action. And it blames external factors on the African economic crisis. That includes declining terms of trade for primary products. Remember, I have explained that during that era, African countries were not getting good prices for their exports. The cocoa, the gold, the diamond, the bauxite, and all other natural resources. That is one, good prices. Secondly, the Europeans, because the Europeans and the North Americans and the developed economy, because of the economic crisis, they also cut down on the volume of import of primary products. So in the first place, they are not buying enough. And secondly, the prices are also not good enough, as it occurred in the 1960s, when prices were good and they were buying a lot. Now, high interest rate was one of the responses that the European countries uh, uh, and, the, and, the, and the developed economies did. Even today, as we speak, because of the ongoing economic crisis globally, some of the developed economies have also increased their interest rates. Right? They have also increased their interest rate, and that is making life very difficult for the countries in Africa to borrow loans from uh, those developed economies. And thirdly, there is also growing debt service commitment. So the, the difficulty that we had was that in 1980, most of the loans that African leaders took in the 1960s matured for payment in 1980s. So they took the loan, remember, they took the loan in 1960. And when you go for loan, there is the principal, which is the big amount of money. You don't pay until after the loan has expired. And some of the loans were 30 years, 20 years, and then so on and so forth. But in between, then you service the loan. So they were servicing the loan, but the principal came due or into maturity in the 1980s, where they now had to pay the principal plus some debt commitment. And now it was too much for some of the countries. Today also, as part of the huge debt burden facing some of the African countries, Nigeria, Ghana, Senegal, Gambia, Cameroon, um, Niger, South Africa, is precisely because some of the loans, the huge loans, were loans contracted 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years, that have become due now. And now you have to pay the principal and it's, it was a lot of money. So these are some of the things that African leaders believe that uh, it's actually uh, I caused the um, African economic crisis. So, if the African leaders now feel that they were externally driven, then what solutions or prescriptions do they have? For African leaders, scholars and policymakers argue that the crisis can be resolved through the following. One, the linking Africa from integration into the global economy. Now, what they are saying is that right from the 15th century, African economies were integrated into the global economy in an unequal status, where Africa only produced raw materials and export them, and then import raw materials. So if Africa and African countries want to do well, they should delink, that is, they should break out or they should leave this international economy in which they have been part of, in which they only serve to produce raw materials and not really valued in this kind of relationship. To so get out of that system and you'll be fine. This is very controversial, right? The second policy is collective self-reliance and increased investment in agriculture. So the African states 
are saying that let's get out of this global or international political economy. Let us now begin to work among ourselves, countries in Africa. Let's trade among ourselves. Let's do business among ourselves. So that is one. Self-reliance. Don't depend on euro. And then increase investment in agriculture because let's invest in agriculture because majority of the citizens are employed in agriculture. When you invest in agriculture, there will be still over effect, right? Economies of scale that will benefit your country and not the Europeans. So instead of dependence, always depending on Europe, always depending on the developed countries, let African countries come together, do business among ourselves, trade among ourselves, let's invest more in agriculture and, and give incentives to farmers. And then the next one is enhancing, you know, the capacity of African states to mobilize natural uh, national resources. So here also, instead of always looking out to Europe, IMF, World Bank for loan, let's begin to see domestically if it is possible for us to make very good use of our natural resources. Let's use them well. The corruption, the stealing, you know, all those smuggling, all those things must stop so that we mobilize our resources effectively for national development. And also foster greater economic integration and cooperation. So yes, African states must you know, do more business with each other. So after Africa, Continental Free Trade, uh, AU, African Union, ECOWAS, uh, 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 SADC, uh, South Africa Development Corporation, EGAD, you know, those regional blocks, let's do more business among ourselves. Let's trade among ourselves. Why is it the case that a country like Nigeria until recently imports huge volume of salt from Brazil? Where they can get those volume of salt also from Ghana? Why would you spend your money to import salt from Brazil instead of Ghana? And why won't Ghana also import from other African countries instead of importing them from China, instead of importing them from Turkey, and so on and so forth? So, um, the challenge is for African countries to break away from the dependency syndrome, do more business among themselves, cooperate more with themselves, mobilize their resources very well, invest in agriculture, and so on and so forth. But there are no more weaknesses in this time of argument. Because they also underestimate the following. That yes, it is true that we cannot entirely blame, you know, African leaders for some of the natural, you know, you know, the drought and, and the external factors like, you know, the debt servicing, the commodity prices issue, the exchange rate issue. Yes, we cannot blame African leaders entirely for that. But it is also true that the most African leaders have governed very, very bad. They have failed to utilize the resources very well at the disposal of their people. They have been involved in corruption is very rife in African countries and those uh, monies that they still put into productive politics. Productive. Then there is this politics of big man politics, you know, loyalty to the big man. Everything revolves around in Africa we have strong presidencies. A lot of power is concentrated in the president. And there is this thing that we call big man politics. Everything revolves around the big man. There is loyalty to the, the big man. If you want job, it's the big man. If you want you know, something good, it's the big man, it's the big woman, and so on and, and so forth. So we need to also check corruption. We need to check bad leadership. We need to check uh, you know, this uh, bad uh, uh, um, politics, uh, uh, big man politics. So, students, now we've come this far. We now know the nature of the African economic crisis. We now know the two main arguments for the African economic crisis. The argument by the neoliberal school, the IMF World Bank, blaming 
African leaders for the crisis. We also know the argument of the you know externalists, the African leaders, the African policymakers, who also blame the crisis on external factors. So, as students, what do you think about this uh, uh, crisis? What is your own position about the causes of the crisis? Do you entirely agree with the new liberal school IMF World Bank, or do you instead agree with the African leaders, policymakers, Africanists, and externalists? Here, I propose a certain, an alternative way of thinking about the argument, where I refer to it as convergence. So I would say that the crisis could not be blamed on either internal or external factors alone. Yes, there were some external issues that triggered or caused the conflict, but there were also some uh, uh, external issues as well. But a combination of both internal and external factors uh, should be held responsible for the crisis. But also importantly, it is useful to look at the crisis in terms of remote and immediate causes. The crisis did not happen overnight. There were some very remote issues, like the slave trade, like the colonial rule, like bad leadership, like bad governance, and then, but the immediate crisis was something like the oil price shock that was so sudden, that just happened, and that threw African economies off gear. And as I mentioned to you, the economic crisis, the oil trigger occurred two separate occasions, 1973-74, that was the first oil crisis, and then the second one was 1978-1979 oil crisis. But the 1979 oil crisis also is very much linked to this whole, um, 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 you know, um, it is more specifically uh, about the Iranian revolution. You know, so 1979, in Iran, Iran, there was a huge revolution. And he also decided to use energy, right, crude oil, as a weapon to get the Americans and the Western countries to recognize uh, 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 the Israeli, uh, sorry, the Iranian revolution. So um, oil has been used as a weapon for uh, 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 um, countries, uh, to punish uh, the Western countries, uh, especially the United States, because of their perceived support to Israel, you know, in the Arab-Israeli conflict. So it is, it is, it makes a lot of sense to look at the uh, crisis in terms of some remote issues and the immediate trigger. Um, in the next slide, we want to spend some time to look at structure adjustment. We want to find out if structure adjustment program actually worked. So the structure adjustment program had mixed impact in Africa. So the positive impact was that as a result of the structure adjustment, when those African countries like, you know, um, uh, Ghana, Senegal, Gambia, you know, decided to implement structure adjustment. Yes, the World Bank IMF gave them loans and through that, you were able to, you know, um, implement some policies that led to improvement in macroeconomic stability. So, before the structure adjustment program, the macro, most of the macroeconomic indicators like inflation, like you know, uh, depreciation of the city, inflation, economic growth, you know, uh, GDP and so on and so forth, mostly negative. In fact, industry's contribution to economic is mostly negative. But as a result of the structure adjust, there was some positive improvement in macroeconomic stability. But nevertheless, I would argue that if you consider the positive impact and the negative impact, the negative impact outweighed the positive one. Because there was rising inequalities, right? Structure adjustment, what happened was that the rich, um, you know, got more richer and the poor people got more poorer. So, structure adjustment could not address the issue of inequality that had existed long 
for the implementation of structure adjustment, but rather structure adjustment further deepen or worsen the inequalities that had existed. Uh, and then poverty. While structure adjustment um, was based on a certain notion that once you have structure adjustment, you will be able to achieve economic growth. And the economic growth that is obtained will trickle down to the masses of people, leading to poverty reduction. Unfortunately, there was some economic growth, right? Some countries grew between 4 and 6% in the, in the, in the uh, mid to late 80s. But that growth was not significant enough or was not too poor enough to be able to take many people out of poverty. So instead, what we saw was that structure adjustment rather deepened the poverty crisis. Then also, there were a lot of social tensions and conflict because of the social cost of structure adjustment, because the removal of subsidies on health, on education, on agriculture, led to a lot of protests on the streets. You know, cost of living became very high because now if you wanted to go to school, especially university, there was what we call uh, uh, cost sharing. If you wanted to visit the hospital, it's cost, uh, it's a user fee. You now have to pay. Agriculture subsidies have been taken away. You now have to pay in full, be able to buy subsidies equipment, you know, for agriculture and so on and, and, and so forth. So yes, structure adjustment led to some uh, uh, improvement in the macroeconomic, you know, uh, stability and management, you know, inflation started re reducing, economic growth started, you know, uh, surging up um, and so on and so forth. But overall, the social cost of adjustment was, was pretty bad. So by way of conclusion, in this lecture, um, uh, I gave a background from hope to despair. I examined the nature and characteristics of the economic crisis. We examined the two main perspectives on the causes of the African economic crisis. I critic the strengths and weaknesses of the argument and solution to the crisis. We looked at the impact of structural adjustment on African economies and livelihood. Now I have some questions for you. What do you consider the immediate trigger for the crisis? Is the crisis due to bad policies or do the roots of crisis lie deeper? So here are some of the uh, questions you need to reflect on it. And then also the key readings for this uh, lecture is Tandika Mutandawara and Charles Duku, 1998, African Perspective on Structure Adjustment. I send this reading to you, so please uh, make an effort to read this. If, if you haven't read it already, it's very interesting. The language is pretty simple, and you should be able to appreciate it without, without any difficulty. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, here is the end of my lecture. Once again, I will pause. We have some few minutes, um, so I will, I will pause to take some, some questions from you. So please, any question for me? Thank you very much for coming to class. I'm, I'm sure you enjoyed the lecture. I will send the slides to you. I will review the recording if it is in good state, then I will also share that with you. I uh, back to you to also read the required readings, for, which is just one. Please do the reading, turn the car. And uh, because if you really want to do well in this class, and if you really want to understand the lecture, you have to. Uh, because we just have two hours, so you have to do the reading, and I'm sure that you, you will love you will love it. Okay, thank you so much once again for coming. I I wish you well. Enjoy the rest of the of the of the week. Bye bye.